from the Department of Communication in Phillipsburg. This is a special edition of Inside Government with Cedric Peterson. Hello to our viewers here at home and around the world. You are now Inside Government. In this edition of the program, my guest is the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, the Honorable Severia Jacobs. Prime Minister, welcome back home, and it's great to have you once again in the program. Thank you so much, Cedric. It's always good to be back on your program and always great to be home. Prime Minister, um, the people of St. Martin should always be reminded how important your role is as Prime Minister, not only in service um, in support to the other members of the Council of Ministers, but the significant role that you have as the minister responsible for foreign affairs. And that is directly reflected in the journey that you've taken as a part of your function as the prime minister with your international and kingdom related travel that you just recently embarked upon and you've returned home. It has taken you to Washington, D.C., Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, along with the Netherlands itself directly at The Hague. Let's talk about the, the trip and what it is that you've experienced. Let's start with your Washington, D.C. route, where you were accompanied by Minister of Romy, uh, the Honorable Egbert Duran, Minister of Finance, um, Ardwell Irian, and also the director of the NRPB. Tell us a bit about the purpose of that trip and what were you able to accomplish? Yes, that was the first leg of the trip for me. I actually had to postpone the actual first leg, which was to go to the water conference, which was hosted by the Netherlands together with Tajikistan as part of a UN water conference, something that I'd worked together with our kingdom partners on, but because we were handling budget, I wasn't able to do that. So that actually worked out that, you know, I wasn't gone for much longer, uh, but the Minister of Romy did do that. So we did meet up at the steering committee meeting for the trust fund. As you know, the trust fund was a, a grant of funds that were um, given to St. Martin post Hurricanes Airman Maria for recovery and reconstruction and resilience building. And um, we are in the, let's say, the final stages of dissemination of the funds. And uh, so it's been a very rough, rough time, um, especially post COVID with um, prices going up. And last year in committee, we were actually uh, fearful that we would not be able to execute all the projects due to the cost. Um, that had gone up on so many areas. Um, however, in this steering committee, we also had to confirm moving forward where we were with the housing project and to sign off on the additional financing of 60 million euros to be able to really realize the true reform of our waste management. So the emergency debris management project, which encompasses not only the cleanup of the lagoon, the cleanup around the island, but to actually get to sustainable waste management, um, now has an extra envelope of 60 million so that we're actually able now to carry that out completely. So it was a very, very um, pivotal steering committee meeting. Our representative, Marcel Gums, uh, was also there as well. He's the one that meets with the other two steering committee meeting um, members from the Netherlands and the World Bank on a regular basis. And of course, uh, the NRPB in the person of uh, Mr. Connor and um, the government of St. Martin with the steering committee members, we have to determine the way forward. And so we have been working diligently and we're able to now secure that extra fund of 60 million for the trust for, for the EDMP project, as well as to confirm that we can move forward with the housing project for St. Martin. So that was, those were the two key parts. I mean, it was a full, you know, meeting where all of the other projects were updated upon and uh, where we could get a clear picture of where we're going, the feasibility, uh, what bottlenecks maybe are there, what attention needs to be paid to what areas, and also in other ways in which we can um, gain more sustainability for all of the projects once they have been completed as well. Prime Minister, though the Netherlands, of course, being responsible for foreign affairs, what's the role that they play in these meetings? So this one, um, it's more of a kingdom one, but because they involve the entity of the World Bank, um, you could see it as a foreign affairs issue, but it was indeed, this one was purely kingdom relations. The World Bank is the third party that is liaising with us, uh, the kingdom and the, sorry, the Dutch government and St. Martin to be able to disseminate the funds. So as a tripartite, steering committee of the Netherlands, World Bank, and St. Martin, it must be a unanimous consensual decision moving forward 
or removing projects. So um, NC Martin leads in that. I must say we've had great support from the bank to be able to move forward with some of the projects because they have to give their input as well as to the feasibility. And they come and they do missions, they come and they do uh, assessments as to the safety, the security, and also seeing the longevity of the fund. We've extended it to 2028. They also give their advice on whether it's feasible within the time span of the fund. So we were able to then confirm that to be able to move forward. But of course, a lot, a lot of work had to be done by the various ministries. And in this case, the Ministry of Rami, and that's why the minister was there. Prime Minister, you made mention of the time span related to the funds. Explain, what, what is that time span? So we have until 2028. So we're currently in 2023. Um, as you may know, for instance, the airport project was scheduled to be done this year. It's been extended to next year, uh, I believe, uh, middle of the year, uh, April to June to be finalized. Um, other projects have had delays, whether through COVID or whether through procurement issues or for whatever the case may be. Um, there are many, many steps that need to be taken. And so with us now confirming, for instance, the housing project, we had to be able to ensure that it could be completed within the time span. So from planning, preparation, design, et cetera, straight through. <clears throat> with the 60 million euros now being approved, Prime Minister, what is now the priority and execution for us here at home? Okay, so the thing is, we had always projected that this emergency debris management um, project, including the revamping of our waste um, landfill, of the processes, Vrami's infrastructure, Vrami's legislation, et cetera, uh, the waste authority, all of that was part of the planning. And it was known that we would need extra funding to be able to fully execute the plan. So the plan has already been made. It is moving forward, but now with the extra funds, it is guaranteed that it can be completed so that the complete uh, landfill is then revamped, way bridge is installed, um, a waste authority is put in place, complete reforms of waste management is done. And of, of, of course it includes um, upgrading legislation as well and ensuring that the general population understands the individual roles that we will play in um, you know, ensuring the sustainability of the reforms that we wanna bring into that are sustainable, that do not have the situation that we had in the past where fires are raging, et cetera. And though that has already been diminished, that was the first part of the project. Um, there is still a lot more to be done and uh, we're moving forward with that plan. And the Ministry of Rami is leading in that regard. All right. Uh, Prime Minister, looking at the trip to Copenhagen, Denmark, the second part of your trip, uh, tell us a little bit about what was involved there with the arrangements with UNOPS. Right. So this one was definitely purely a foreign relation matter. Um, it had to, of course, go through the natural approvals of the Kingdom Council of Ministers for us to be able to host countries here at St. Martin. Um, that's a treaty that is being signed. And so I was authorized on behalf of the Kingdom to sign for St. Martin um, in this treaty, which allows the UNOPS, which is a United Nations um, Projects Services Group, to be able to establish its offices here on St. Martin. As you know, we went through a process which was led by the Foreign Affairs Department to be able to uh, adopt legislation several years ago, um, two years ago, I believe, whereby the World Bank could be established. But it's not just the World Bank, it's any international agency that we would want to establish here on St. Martin that requests it, and then we would agree, and then it goes through the process. Um, but it gives us then that opportunity, and it's also, if you could remember, clearly would have given us for that pre-clearance uh, opportunity as well, which is now on hold. So it gives the opportunity for St. Martin to have international agencies established on the island, have offices on the island. And as you know, many came in after the disaster to assist us in various ways. And with us having um, agreements ahead of time, it facilitates the response after any type of a disaster. In fact, preparation for, and then the response after a disaster. In this case, UNOPS has already engaged with the Ministry of Justice to start the process for 
the project, uh, security project, which includes the rebuilding of the prison. This was signed with um, the Minister of Justice in December. With them now signing a host country agreement with St. Martin, it now gets them boots on the ground to be here on a consistent basis to facilitate the process for the design and execution of that project. And we are in the process of engaging them for another project on sustainability, which you will be hearing a little bit more about as we concretize those agreements. But again, it opens up. It opens up opportunity for St. Martin. And for that, we are very, very proud. Uh, we were there on the invitation of UNOPS and at the behest of UNOPS. And so the Minister of Justice was also invited to join, seeing that her project is the first project that UNOPS will be executing on St. Martin. Does it cost the country anything to form these types of relationships with an organization, for example, like UNOPS? Well, in the onset, the, the initial legislation to make it possible was a cost for government. Um, in the sense of cost, cost, uh, they would have to, uh, how you say, uh, apply for certain visas, etc., cetera, um, permits and the like. But they would also be able to have privileges as well as um, diplo diplomats in that sense. So uh, they, they gain from the process, but St. Martin gains from having the office here, et cetera. Um, there's no cost directly to government for them to establish their offices. This is totally to their account. And um, of course, then we will then see how we roll forward with what they will have to do. Their persons, the persons that, they, that come here to live will have to rent homes. Um, buy groceries, uh, get vehicles and all the like. So uh, all in all, them establishing uh, an office here on St. Martin, just as the World Bank is in the process of doing, will have an economic spin-off for St. Martin as well. And do they work independently or is there some type of form of government oversight? It's um, their office. So it's like the UN office within St. Martin. And just like the World Bank, we don't have a governance over their office, but we are they are collaborating. They are doing work on behalf of government and on the request of government. So the works will be guided by government and government's priorities. Speaking to the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs for Country St. Martin, the Honorable Severia Jacobs, stay with us. The next part of our program, we're going to talk about the trip to the Netherlands where the journey of the Prime Minister and her international and kingdom-related travel culminated with that visit. Conversation with the Prime Minister continues after these public service announcements. Stay with us. Carnival is to be enjoyed. Just be careful with drinking and driving. It is forbidden to drive while intoxicated. It is a crime, so be mindful. Think of yourself, your family, and loved ones of other families. No one wants to get hurt or die. For this carnival season, don't drive while intoxicated. This message has been brought to you by the Department of Communication. If you're just joining us, I'm having a conversation with the Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, the Honorable Severia Jacobs, in this edition of Inside Government. And we're talking about the her international and kingdom-related travel that she's just embarked upon um, if you're just tuning in, we talked about the prime minister's visit to the uh, pr the capital of the United States of America, Washington, D.C., where she uh, basically was jo joined with the minister of finance, the minister of roaming, and also her trip to Copenhagen, Denmark, where she signed uh, an agreement with the organization that represents the United Nations. That's the UNOPS, um, as they'll be establishing an office here in St. Martin. And now the culmination of your trip, Prime Minister, was in the Netherlands. Uh, can you give us some insight in regard to that journey and what was um, done in that specific um, trip? Though it was the shortest part of the journey, I must say it was indeed one that has, I think, the most impact directly right away for the people of St. Martin. Um, we've been under a lot of discussions and negotiations over the past two and a half years. And the 4th of April signing of the mutual agreement to move forward in a respectful, in a manner that had more equity for the countries um, was a big milestone for us, for the kingdom, but especially for the Cas Islands, the Curacao, Aruba and St. Martin who have been post COVID in a relationship, especially uh, of need. 
uh, one that required us to have liquidity support. And the agreement we'd signed at that time with the former state secretary had us receiving liquidity support in, a, um, let's say, in exchange for agreement for a coming organization called the COHO, which initially none of us wanted, none of us thought was the right vehicle for such an arrangement. Um, but based on the fact that we had needs at the time of a financial nature to sustain our people, um, we all agreed to work towards it. Um, this was in December of 2020 for St. Martin as the last island to sign on with a very heavy heart because along with that came that you had to take some necessary cuts as well. In the meantime, these cuts have been raised. What we did agree to, though, was that there were certain reforms that needed to take place in each of our countries. We didn't agree in the manner in which these reforms um, came down, but we could see ourselves in the actions that needed to take place. And so we worked at St. Martin on our national development vision, which is grounded in the governing, governing programs from 2010 up until when we came in in 2020. And so it is a broad-based goal of the people of St. Martin, the elected officials of St. Martin in terms of what we saw as necessary since becoming a constituent state slash country within this kingdom and having all the responsibilities that we now had, for which we were ill-prepared, I must say. And um, in doing that, a lot of reforms needed to happen. So we can underpin all the reforms that have been put on the table in some form or fashion within that NDV. And that has been the basis since November under which we are working with the Temporary Working Organization of the Netherlands. The mutual arrangement we just signed on April 4th now concretizes that arrangement, now uh, cements the manner in which we are working together. Because besides that, we have also a protocol which regulates how the two entities discuss. No longer do we have a consensus law hanging our, over our heads that requires constant approval of the Kingdom Council of Ministers. The highest entities that are deciding are the Prime Minister as a representative of the Council of Ministers and the State Secretary as a representative of the Dutch government. So our working organizations will do the work to prepare the agendas together. The execution will be done and the reporting will be done together and there has to be agreement on a political level by both the state secretary and I for it to be finalized, for the agenda to be established and for the reports to be completed and established as well. And so it remains then a government to government agreement and it is much more based on equity and on the interests, needs and priorities of the individual countries themselves. So we're very, very pleased to have transitioned from what was intended several years ago with a consensus law to now having a mutual arrangement based on um, open collaboration, honest collaboration and equitable collaboration between kingdom partners. How would you describe the differences between us and our sister countries, especially in these negotiations and these respective needs when you look at your counterparts? How would you describe it? So we each have our own individual priorities and um, within the country packages of reforms, there are some similarities. And so in this area, we're able to work together. Something that has not happened prior to this period of time is the good manner in which we have collaborated. It is because we stuck together as a unit, as the three countries within the kingdom, is how we were able to better negotiate a position. Of course, each country has other things going on. Right now, Aruba has a different financial situation than Curacao has or we have. Uh, Curacao is doing better financially, um, was able to turn around and go into the black faster than the rest of us. We are doing okay now. We're working on a balanced budget. It was approved before we flew out uh, for this work travel in the end of March as per the deadline. So <clears throat> that was also very important. And um, Aruba has more debt based on the fact that they've been an independent country for a lot longer and they had the opportunity to go on an open market. Our only debt, Curacao and St. Martin, is to the Netherlands where we get our loans. And as you know, all of the liquidity loans that have been issued uh, post-COVID 
which initially were discussed as they're alone now, but we can discuss them becoming grants. Um, these are being renegotiated on all three islands, but individually, not as a collection because they are individual debts and they all have different, you know, let's call it strings attached. Um, but in all manner and ways that we can collaborate to sit at the table as four countries in the best interest of the kingdom, we do so. And we meet on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, uh, before our Kingdom Council of Ministers, we meet and we also meet more often as a tripartite. So I think we are in a much better space relationship-wise within the kingdom. One of the key things that um, you focus on, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the key things you focus on, Prime Minister, um, with responsibility for especially the Department of Bach um, and traveling and dealing with foreign affairs is the issue about the climate change situation, and especially since you talked about uh, getting the necessary funding when it comes to waste management and, of course, our preparedness when it comes to debris and cleanup of the island in the event of any type of emergency. Um, what is now the view concerning the fact that um, climate change, though we do not contribute much to it, we suffer more from it as small island developing states? And one of the issues we would see in our region is the effect of rising seas and water being an issue. Tell right. us, what has been the discussion like when it comes to climate change and affecting us as a CID and how we can probably, you know, ensure and strengthen our resiliency moving forward? You have really touched on something that I've become super passionate about over the past two years. And my international travels to EarthX, to the United Nations, high level um, HLPF in uh, last year, I think July, and then in September again to the United Nations General Assembly, which was for the first time in person. Um, it was really an eye opener for me. It brought to um, to the foreground that as a member of a rich kingdom, that we are at a disadvantage as small island developing states on the international scene because we do not have access to concessionary financing. We do not have access to funds that the independent Caribbean countries, the Pacific Islands and the other islands that are under threat for high um, for rising seas as a, as a, as a result of climate change, um, for, for dying out coral reefs as a result of climate change, um, excessive rainfall that we're experiencing, stronger storms that we have experienced already in 2017. And we can expect to continue to experience should the world, should the superpowers not do more to achieve the goals by 2030 as has been determined. Um, we are on the front lines. And what this offered St. Martin, though you might say, oh, you're a small island, you're going there as part of the Netherlands and the kingdom. What are you, what say do you have? First of all, it was the first time in which the kingdom was recognized as four countries. Um, though the name plate last year still said Netherlands, this year it will say kingdom of the Netherlands. And that's a huge step forward. Um, it took that long for the change to, to happen on the name plate, but it was referred to verbally and on the papers, etc. as such. It just took a longer time. They recognize now that there are three small vulnerable countries that are SIDS within the kingdom, within the United Nations. And everyone is thinking along as to how to ensure that we are also getting the needed assistance for development in these areas where climate change is concerned. And the SDGs play a huge role. So the Department of Buck has been working on promoting the SDGs. Um, as you know, we've done the plastic free campaign or started it, and we now had to transition from plastic free by 2023 to plastic free St. Martin. And we hope to use DCOM and other outlets to be able to promote how each and every citizen on St. Martin can contribute to bringing down our carbon footprint, reducing the amount of energy we use that is reliant upon fossil fuels, but also on the way we dispose of our trash. We are the ones that are dirtying the earth. And the only earth we are dirtying right now is St. Martin. So while we're not contributing highly to the emissions, we are contributing in little ways that affect our health, that affect our well-being. And so we must do what we have to do as well. And the future of St. Martin, I mean, as you know, the lowlands area is called lowlands for a reason, just like the Netherlands, Netherlands is also low-lying lands. So 
That's one of the reasons they were the front runners in the water conference. Water is a serious blessing and challenge for both the Netherlands and our Caribbean islands. And so, you know, it's unfortunate I missed that, but I'm looking forward to the ways in which we will be able to get the necessary development funds to be able to mitigate all of the risks associated with water on St. Martin. And um, out of all those talks, Cedric, I can say that um, it's now opened the doors in the Netherlands, actually, for us to receive financing. So on a kingdom level from the National Groeifonds and well as the SDE plus plus, both which fall within the Ministry of Energy and Climate. And I just, in the meetings in The Hague, we were also able to, I was able to have a very key and pivotal meeting with Minister Ropietin and his team, um, who is willing and ready to assist St. Martin in any way that they can with funding, because now they're making that fund available to the Cos Islands as well. This was previously not the case. And so these international forays, these discussions on an international level also improves and, and assist us to be able to get funding within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And I think that is a great positive for St. Martin. There are opportunities now uh, before we would get smaller funding via the EU through BAC. Um, and it's mostly seed funding, it's research, it's, you know, a small 100,000 here, or 10,000 there, or 20,000 there. But now we'll be having access to millions, which would be uh, leading to more sustainable um, energy, et cetera. Prime Minister, we're closing out this um, part of the program, of course, and I want to give you the opportunity for final words to the general public of St. Martin. Yes, thank you, Steve, uh, Cedric. It's always a pleasure to share information with the people of St. Martin. For me, these goals here, the SDGs, are the key. And as you see, St. Martin's logo is right here. In our NDV, we're focused on achieving the 17 goals. The last goal is the one that I've been hammering because it says collaborating for the goals, partnerships for the goals. And so what we're doing is trying to alleviate poverty, goal one. We're trying to ensure good health and well-being, goal three. Quality education, goal four. Ensuring gender equity in everything we do. And St. Martin is actually leading in that. Clean water and sanitation, six, which is key to what we were just discussing. Um, industry, innovation, and infrastructure needed for our EDMP. 11, sustainable cities and communities. That is something we're doing across our country packages, across the Trust Fund projects. And climate action is one that we must, must bring more awareness to the people of. So I ask them to stay tuned. There will be more informative sessions coming forward, as well as awareness campaigns as we move forward with our plastic free campaign. But it is up to each and every one of us. And I hope that we can all see ourselves as part of the solutions. Prime Minister and Minister of General Affairs, the Honorable Severia Jacobs. Prime Minister, thank you once again for joining us in this edition of the program. Thank you. And to our radio listeners, television viewers, and online viewers, thank you for tuning in and being a part of this discussion with the Prime Minister. If you've missed it, be sure to get video on demand at the official YouTube channel of the Government of St. Martin at youtube.com, Government of St. Martin. And for audio playback, be sure to tune in to St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9 FM throughout the course of the day for playback of this conversation with the Prime Minister. On behalf of all of the, the Department of Communication and, of course, the Cabinet of the Prime Minister of St. Martin, I'm Cedric Peterson. Thanks so much for tuning in.